The funeral is about to begin. Horror films have some of the most memorable and iconic villains in movie history. Jason Voorhees, Michael Myers, Norman Bates, Chucky. One that's often overlooked by the mainstream, but beloved by hardcore horror fans, is the tall man from this week's movie, Phantasm. Phantasm is a 1979 horror film from director Don Coscarelli. The movie opens in a very popular mating spot for drunk people. The cemetery. Ugh, beer goggles are wearing off. The girl pulls out a knife and stabs the guy. At the Morningside Cemetery, we see the largest mortuary in the world. Reggie and Jody are there for the funeral of their friend Tommy, the guy who we just saw killed. <laughs> it's hard to believe that he killed himself. So the police think he went into the middle of a cemetery, pulled down his pants, and stabbed himself in the stomach? Jody's in the mausoleum and hears creepy noises. Martini! The place is infested with Jawas. Nah, it's cool, kid. Just drive your dirt bike across the cemetery. Nobody minds. This is Mike, Jody's little brother. Jody's wandering around and runs into the tall man. How do you make a mausoleum more creepy? And this guy running it. Is this what kids did before video games? Spy on funerals? After the funeral, Mike notices something odd about the mortician. He heads to the local mages guild to get some answers. He asks the seer about his brother and why he's leaving. She's so old she accepts payments in tapioca pudding. He tells the fortune teller about what he saw at the cemetery. Instead of giving him answers, she tells him to stick his hand in a box and learn not to be afraid. Uh, thanks, I guess. Horror fans aren't usually car guys, but everyone who grew up watching this wanted a Hemikuda. Jody's been taking care of Mike ever since their parents died. Now that the kid's 13, uh, yeah, I'm thinking of sending him off to live with his aunt. He's a tough little kid. I love him. I'm gonna miss him. Yeah, I love that kid. I can't wait to get rid of him. Now for a brief musical interlude, it's time to get the old band back together. Please welcome Bowler Hat and Stoner Ice Cream Guy. We're hot as love, you know. They're what? Jody goes to a bar and has the fastest pickup ever. Does Mike just follow Jody around watching him hook up with random chicks? No wonder he wants to leave. Hey, my friend died up here a few days ago. You want to check it out? What's the only thing to do in this town? Well, aside from you, not much really. Okay, so what's more creepy? A guy and a girl doing it on top of a grave in a cemetery where the guy's friend just died, or the little brother of the guy watching him and a girl do it on top of a grave in a cemetery where the guy's friend just died. Young or old, you show a guy a great set of boobs, and this is the reaction. Wow. Mike gets attacked and runs off. Uh, excuse me, is there something in my teeth? Mike explains to Jody the thing that was chasing him. What's out there? I don't know. It was, it was little and brown and low to the ground. <laughs> the next day, Mike's walking through town and he sees the tall man. Oh, oh, my sweet tooth. I could really go for a push-up pop. No, no, gotta be mindful of my figure. I'm just going to walk away now and have a nice salad. Mike's working on the car when it gets dropped on him. They were jumping on the car and making these, these weird sounds. Sure wasn't that uh, retarded kid Timmy up the street? <laughs> wow. That night, Mike sneaks out to investigate the funeral home. Okay, got to be quiet. Don't make any noise. Got to sneak in so no one will know I'm here. Ah, fuck it. <laughs> While wandering through the mausoleum, Mike sees this flying sphere. Some guy grabs a hold of him, but he gets loose. He just saw this guy's brains get drilled out, but ew, pee. The tall man chases after Mike and gets his hand stuck in a door. He cuts his fingers off, and he's full of French's mustard. Mike takes one of the fingers to show his brother. Thankfully, after seeing a finger moving on its own, Jody believes him. Mike goes to check on the finger, but now it's a giant rubber fly. Reggie shows up, and the fly is still alive. Okay, now it's finally dead. Jody heads up to Morningside to check things out for himself. He goes to sneak in, and the music abruptly stops.
He kills one of the minions and gets the hell out of there. Mike comes to pick him up and gets chased by a hearse. After a few shotgun rounds, the hearse crashes. They open the car to see the dwarf chasing them was their friend Tommy. Reggie meets Jody and Mike back at their place, and who the hell is this lady? Hey! You boys back here? Yeah? Jody and Reggie are going to kill the tall man, so they send Mike to stay at the antique store where he'll be safe. While there, Mike finds one of those antique lenticular motion cards. It's a picture of the tall man from years ago. The girls from the antique store are driving Mike back to his house. The minions attack the girls, but Mike escapes and runs home. He spends a lot of this movie running. <laughs> Jody locks Mike in the room so he can go face the tall man. I've been waiting for you. Mike's in the back of the hearse being taken to the cemetery. He shoots out the back window and why doesn't he shoot the driver? Okay, that works. One of the balls flies at Mike and Jody blasts it. Reggie shows up to tell him he rescued a few girls. They head into a mysterious room filled with barrels of shrunken people. Mike finds these two pillars which open a portal to another world. He looks in and finally figures out the tall man's motives. Slaves. They're using them for slaves. The dwarves. And they gotta crush them because of the gravity. So he steals men's souls and makes them his slaves. The lights go out and everyone gets separated. Reggie realizes the portal's using a frequency to stay open, so he messes with it, which causes it to go crazy. Reggie goes to save the blonde girl, but gets stabbed. Mike and Jody escape. Now with the portal screwed up, it sucks the building back to the tall man's world. The tall man chases Mike all the way to this mine shaft, where he falls in and they trap him. Mike wakes up and it was a dream? He's living with Reggie because Jody died in a car wreck. Mike goes upstairs to get some stuff and finds out, nope, wasn't a dream. The sequel explains the ending in much greater detail, but you'll have to wait for that video. Or you could go rent Phantasm 2 now. It's an awesome movie. The movie was filmed in various locations in California over the course of a year for about $300,000. In 1976, Coscarelli directed a film called Kenny and Company. In the film, there was a brief scare sequence where the characters were trapped in a haunted house. Coscarelli loved seeing the audience react to the scares, so he decided to make a full-on horror film. Director Don Coscarelli had the idea for the film after reading the Ray Bradbury novel, Something Wicked This Way Comes. Shortly after, he had a nightmare about being chased down a marble corridor by a metal sphere. To get in the right frame of mind, Coscarelli spent weeks in an isolated cabin to write the script. Although when it came time to shoot, many of the scenes were either changed or altered on the spot. Filming the movie was often referred to as flying by the seat of your pants filmmaking. Many of the actors weren't actors, they were either friends or family. For example, the minister was Reggie's father, and many of the people in the funeral were family members. This was a real bar in South Beach. The owner agreed to let them film there as long as he was in the movie. That's him in the background with the hat. They couldn't afford stuntmen, so most of the cast did the stunts themselves. The scene where Mike is hiding in a coffin was filmed in Sunnyside Mortuary in Long Beach. They put two pieces of cardboard over the camera lens to get the effect of Mike looking out of the coffin. They did a similar thing with the binoculars. The Dunsmuir House in Oakland, California was used as the exterior for the mausoleum. This building was also used in Burnt Offerings, A View to a Kill, and So I Married an Axe Murderer. They shot all their exteriors there in two days. Coscarelli rented warehouse space for the mausoleum interior. He hired a film student that had a background in carpentry to build the halls. The warehouse was brand new and had these unblemished marble floors. The walls they built were all wooden and were covered with contact paper to appear to be made out of marble. Originally, Coscarelli wanted to get dwarf actors to play the minions. Unfortunately, the ones he found weren't agile enough. His neighbor had a few kids who were about the same size, and they were perfect as the hooded creatures. A lot of people say he ripped off the look of the dwarves from George Lucas's Jawas in Star Wars. This was merely a coincidence, because even though this was released after Star Wars, production began well before anyone had even heard of the film. For the cemetery, Coscarelli rented tombstones from 20th Century Fox and placed them all over Chatsford Park. The theme music in this is classic.
Coscarelli grew up with giallo films and wanted to have a similar synthesizer soundtrack in the vein of Goblin. What he got, in my opinion, is a memorable theme right up there with Halloween. The death metal band Entombed covered this at the end of the first track off their album Left Hand Path. The spheres, or balls, were done in a fairly rudimentary way. No CGI or fancy effects, just good old-fashioned on-set ingenuity. For the scene where the ball flies in for the first time, it was thrown down the hall, and then the footage was played backwards. When it comes around corners, it was attached to fishing wire. When it smacked into the bad guy's head, they started by having it attached to his head, and then pulled it backwards. They then played the film backwards to make it appear as if it was moving forward. They ran a small hose up under the actor's clothes, threw the ball, and pumped out the fake blood. In the game Turok 2 Seeds of Evil for Nintendo 64, there was a weapon called the Cerebral Boar. It was a small silver sphere that tracks down an enemy, lodges in their head, and drills their brains out. This was inspired by Phantasm. The house where a good chunk of the film takes place was rented by Coscarelli as a place where him and some of the crew could live while they were making the movie. Coscarelli's mother Kate designed both the finger and the bug for the film. When the house vanishes, it's actually the same effect they used in the original Star Trek for the transporter. The casket the tall man picks up was actually made out of balsa wood and styrofoam. It broke the first time he picked it up, so they had two more takes before they finally got the scene right. You can see one of the cracks in the top, as well as the rope on the side so he could hold it easier. And that brings us to Angus Scrim, the tall man. An incredibly talented character actor, he brought the right amount of feel to the role. Standing at six foot four, he was already imposing, but they added lifts to make him six foot seven. Coscarelli was both fascinated and disgusted by death, plus he was freaked out by morticians, so that was where he got the concept for the tall man. A lot of people were confused by the character. Was he a demon? Was he a monster? The tall man was actually an alien from another dimension, possibly another planet, that's come to Earth in the form of Jebediah Morningside. He travels from town to town, taking our dead, crushing them, and sending them to his world to be his slaves. His world's very hot, which is why when he passes Reggie's ice cream truck, he pauses in pain. And this movie is awesome. It's by far one of the most unique horror films out there. It's full of iconic things. The villain, the balls, the theme, and even the Hemikuda, which is pretty much the DeLorean for horror films. The scene where Mike wakes up and is dragged to the grave is often listed as one of horror's scariest moments. While this wasn't Coscarelli's first movie, this was the one that put him on the map. He started an amazing franchise and even outdid himself with the incredible sequel. This is one of those horror films that's made by someone with a grand imagination, tons of creativity, and an obvious love of the genre. If you consider yourself a horror fan and you haven't seen this, you need to watch it as soon as possible. Die, monster! You don't belong in this world. It was not by my hand that I'm once again given flesh. I was called here by humans who wish to pay me tribute. Tribute? You steal men's souls and make them your slaves. Perhaps the same could be said of all religions. Your words are as empty as your soul. Mankind ill needs a savior such as you. What is a man? A miserable little pile of secrets. But enough talk. How about you? 